Greetings from Dallas Willard Ministries. I'm Bill Dwyer, and I hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this series. By the way, we love to hear from you in the comment section below. I'd like to, to expand a little about uh, prayer. Yes. Well, uh, the first thing is the prayer is conversation. It is a two-way uh, discussion, if you wish. Um, and uh, the primary reason, uh, because one can very well ask, you know, why should there be such an arrangement? And often theological questions are in the background, like, well, doesn't God already know? Um, or the question, do you think what you say to God is going to make any difference to what he does? In fact, those are the two main questions, I think, that very, come up very early in children's minds. You're teaching them to pray, and they want to know, well, and the other question, like, well, can he hear me from here? And uh, so there are a lot of questions there to deal with. Um, I do think that we need to help people understand what the presence of God everywhere means. And it means that he's capable of knowing and acting at any place because reality is so interconnected that everything reflects on everything else in some measure. For example, a child can often be helped if you talk to them about telephones and telegraphs and television and all these other, these tele-things, about how, for example, we can, we can go through matter to affect people at a far distance. And then they get the idea that, well, someone doesn't have to be here in order to be heard, and then you can tell them God is here also. And so you, there are ways that you can help people. Again, this is a problem with imagination. Uh, there are other questions that come up, like how can God hear everyone at once? Right. That one gets some discussion too. And uh, actually the computer metaphor of multitasking can help many people here to realize that even machines are capable of doing many things at one time, and that people also are capable of doing many things at one time. So those are those kinds of issues. I think uh, you think along those lines, and it's it's helpful to do that. Other issues like why why do we need to tell God? Doesn't he already know? There are two main things to be said here. One is uh, that even, and, and here we need to use the analogies of human experience. Uh, you could say to a child, for example, uh, uh, wouldn't I like for you to talk to me about what you want, even if I know what you need? Right? What would it be like if automatically I did everything for you that I knew you needed done. Would that be a personal relationship? And I think there, very quickly people see that it, it wouldn't be. It would be a kind of caretaker relationship, possibly. But it wouldn't be a personal relationship. So people, when they relate, they want to come together and they want to have a discussion and know what's on one another's hearts. Uh, and in fact, the relationship apart from that is a demeaning one. It's personally demeaning because it doesn't take into consideration the freedom of the individual uh, to enter into a conversational relationship. Um, then there's the issue of if God doesn't want to know something, could he do that? And you might say just reasoning logically, since he's all-powerful, he could. He could not know something if he wanted to not know something. And you can have a discussion about why that's a good thing. I mean, if again, go back to your mates or your children and say, would it be good for me to know everything I could know? And certainly if you ask your teenage child, they will tell you no. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I think the truth is on their side. That, uh, that the way we're built, we need room to not be known. 
And in fact, character only develops in a situation where one is not being known and is free to do what they want without being known. That's where character comes in. You know, you hear people say character is what you do when no one's looking. Well, how do you get there? Well, by being in a situation where no one is looking. So, and I think that that principle, which is true in life, is still uh, true between God and human beings. Now, my belief is that if one wants to be known of God, then they can tell God, and God will enter wherever they want him. But that he's not going to do that, at least for now, unless we welcome him there. Uh, the other thing that comes up here is, is God actually going to change what he was going to do? And I think in some cases he clearly does. We have a couple of cases in the Bible, Moses and Hezekiah, where pretty clearly he had something else in mind, and he changes his mind as to what he was going to do. Some people find that threatening to God's immutability, but I think God's immutability applies to his character and his purposes, and those aren't going to change. But in relationship to individuals, and sometimes in relationships to groups, he will do what he is asked to do and would not do otherwise. Right? Now this is really a deep one and a troubling one. Right? So I don't mean to address it in any other way than that. And some people just cannot get over the idea that God has everything planned out. I mean everything. I don't mean just the main things. <laughs> I mean, everything, like which chair are you to be seated in right now? Uh, I, I think that's a mistaken view of God. I think God has created a world in which there's an awful lot of freedom and contingency, and it's an important thing for human beings that it be there, and um, that there are many things he has no will on that doesn't diminish him in the least for him not to have a will on it. Um, it just means he's great enough that he doesn't need to. And uh, so uh, these, are, these are deep matters. I encourage anyone to read Jesus' teachings about prayer in Matthew, uh, sorry, in Luke 11 and uh, in Matthew 6 uh, and again in, uh, what is it, Luke 17 or 18, the story of the, of the unjust judge and the widow. And these are put in very human terms. And uh, there's a lot of play in the relationship between the individual and God. And I think we really need to respect that. And to understand that that's God's provision. It's not something that shows that he is less, but something that shows his true greatness. And... Uh, then we can, we can say, well, prayer does make a difference. If you don't believe this, prayer will become a kind of mood adjustment. And you will be told prayer is good for you, but it doesn't make any difference otherwise. And in fact, you're in a domain now where it wouldn't even require that God exist. Prayer would still be good for you. And probably that's right, humanly. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you get with a lot of teachings about meditation is basically human psychology, and it's true. What it says is true. It's just that's not the same thing as prayer. Prayer is living in a personal relationship, not with a force, but a being that has personal character, and we're living together with them in a universe that uh, we want to bring him into as much of our lives as we can, but that does not extinguish individual initiative and the need for us to take up matters with God and talk about them. Dallas, if you're carrying a burden, um, what practical steps are there for laying it down and casting it on the Lord? Uh, do mm -hmm. you just stop thinking about it? Because well, if, you, if you do that... Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, they're soaking <laughs> prayer, but on the other hand, if you pray about it, all throughout the day, you can just use that as an occasion to obsess and worry well, about it. Well, you see, so. that's, that's it. We want to be clear about the difference between praying and worrying. And actually, many people don't know the difference. They think, they can think if they're thinking about something they're concerned about, they're praying. 
And that's why I really do, I think following Jesus' teachings on prayer, just say, look, prayer is basically an, a matter of asking and receiving and communicating about that. Asking, receiving. And the reason I say that is because if you look at what Jesus did when he was asked by his disciples to teach them to pray, it was fundamentally a series of types of requests. And his teaching about the man who comes for the loaf of bread and his teaching about the widow. See, that's all in the area of request. Now, there are a lot of other things you do in that context. For example, worship is very appropriate to prayer. Um, praise, that's very appropriate. Uh, and thanksgiving, very appropriate. So our conversational relationship with God doesn't just consist of asking and receiving, but asking and receiving is the heart of prayer. And so what I would say is this, that if you have a burden that you're carrying, and you want to, as the scripture says, cast your burden on the Lord, uh, is you give that to God by explicit statement and ask him to help you leave it there and to fill your mind with other things. And that's what I would do. Because you're right on. I mean, it's, it's uh, many people don't, they, they have a burden and they don't know how to lay it down. Um, and so they just wind up carrying it. Um, now, another thing that helps me is to read the Psalms. That, that helps me displace in my mind the thing that might be burdening me. And it does that by giving me a greater vision of God. And it's, it's the vision of the greatness of God that is my peace. And when I have that and I see that, then uh, I can commit something to God and walk off and leave it there. So the old song, bring your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. That's the, that's the part. We have to, it's like forgiveness and a lot of other things. We have to recognize that if we succeed with it, it's because God has helped us. And uh, we always want to remember that what Paul says in Romans 8, but we do not know how to pray as we ought. The Holy Spirit helps us, and sometimes it's with groanings that cannot be uttered. Uh, so we just take that in consideration and ask God to help us. But the real key is to say specifically, what you want God to do with it, and then get away from that and move on to something else. Practically, that's what I find works. Dallas, I learned the gospel of sin management. I also learned to share the gospel mm -hmm. of sin management. I'm interested in hearing how you go about sharing the real gospel mm -hmm. with one who is seeking an open. Mm -hmm. Good, that's a wonderful question. Uh, first of all, I mean, sin needs to be taken care of, and we don't want to forget about that. It's a question of how you do it. And I think you don't do it by just focusing on that unless that is the burden that happens to be, you happen to be carrying, and then you have to deal with it. But for example, here's a way that I, I will sometimes speak to people who I think are ready to hear. I will say, uh, well, I've used different phrases. One phrase that I use, are you a friend of Jesus? Very hard for people to drop that. <laughs> um, if you say, is Jesus your friend? They'll say, well, I don't know. And so when you put it on them, then you've got something for them to work on. And that, I think, is the single most important thing in this area, is to give people something to work on and not try to give them the answer before they get the question. So another question I like to use is, how are you doing with your kingdom today? And, and that's really helpful. Even children understand that. How are you doing with your kingdom today? Um, because everyone knows they're out there, they've got to deal with it. That's the nature of the case. Uh, and their kingdom is what they have say over and responsibility for. And very often they really don't think they're doing so well. And uh, sometimes they've been trying to manage their kingdom in the wrong way. 
and they've gotten into dependencies or addictions that are ruining their life. Or evasions also. It's amazing how much, how much evasion we, we have and that we depend upon to just get through the, through the day. We don't confront the issues. And uh, so sometimes just uh, something like that can help a lot. Sometimes you can see a person is burdened and you can just say, what, what, what's the burden you're carrying today? You need a little help with it. Uh, so I think we need to be creative and concentrate mainly on questions. And uh, you know, you can change these around. Like the way we were trained, um, what would happen to you if you died tonight? Well, you can ask, what would happen to you if you don't die tonight? Right. Are you ready to live instead of are you ready to die? So I think we just need to be creative and very thoughtful and prayerful. I really think that when we're doing this work, we need to know that we are being moved and directed by the Spirit. And that will give us great peace. So we won't think that we have to sort of unload something on them. Uh, we can listen and watch. And now, you know, uh, you remember that Jesus said, be wise as serpents. And it helps to, to think about what is the wisdom of the serpent. And uh, you nearly, have, I, I've never seen a case of a serpent chasing down its prey. I understand that there are certain kinds of snakes that can actually do that. But normally they don't. The, the wisdom of the serpent is timeliness. Timeliness. They watch. They wait. And the time is right. I think that's what Jesus is talking about. As harmless as doves. Doves are incapable of subtlety. That's an amazing thing about them. They, they're incapable of it. Doves are so simple-minded. They cannot pull off deception. And I think we want to be like that too. Totally transparent. And then now you see this is a different kind of Word, this is a word of discipleship that comes through when you, when you approach it in this way. And this can be discipleship evangelism. And then all the issues about social issues, church issues, guilt issues, they can all be dealt with and they, they will be from this approach. It's just that we don't cut it down to them. And that I think is what's really important. Um, Dallas, just I think we're all concerned about changing our society back to God, our country. Mm -hmm. um, looking back in history, you know, the Hebrew people were miserably lost, and God was in His grace, uh, grace sent Jesus, right? And the church took off, and then mm -hmm. Constantine became mm -hmm. Christian, and, and all of a sudden things were getting better. Then all of a sudden we hit the Dark Ages, and things fall apart again, you know. And mm -hmm. then thank God for Martin Luther, and all this mm -hmm. change again, and the Reformation. And now we're kind of drifting backwards. How much, in your opinion, through, this, through the years, is God just good and he just inserts himself? We need a revival across the world, our country, and take some people and goes for it, versus is it us just people deciding to really get serious and pray about change? Well, I, think that, uh, I do think that there is a timeliness on God's part as well, uh, and we need to be able to discern that. But on the other hand, clearly there is something for us to do. And in our country, we often hear quoted the verse, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear and so forth and so on. So I think that's our part. Now, our problem today is that very often we hear that verse quoted, but we don't do it. And even the people who quote it as a kind of promise don't really tell us how to do it, right? And it's a promise to the people who are called by his name, and that doesn't necessarily mean people who are perfect. It's just the people who are identified with him. 
if they will humble themselves. And that, first of all, means that they stop trusting their own devices. That's what humbling themselves means. Now, once you humble yourself in that sense, you're going to be ready to pray. Okay, so humble themselves, pray, and you're going to see the importance of turning from wrongdoing. So all of that comes in a package. And I think really what we, what we have to do is start with humbling ourselves. And that would mean that we, re we recognize that we're up against something that we cannot do by our own cleverness or techniques or political movements or education or whatever it is. And uh, I think if we start there and go that route, then we will do our part, and I'm sure God will do his part. But so often, it, uh, when we start to do something, we get up a big movement of some kind. Uh, and as far as you can tell, God is not really a part of it. See, the movements that come in history are usually for small groups of people who actually did what that verse says. And I think we should understand that it doesn't take the whole nation, but it does take a significant group of people who are prepared to really do that. And you can go back and tick them off as you did some of them there. Uh, uh, after Constantine, for example, there was a, a movement which became known as monasticism, but when it began, it was a powerful movement for God. And, and it has had tremendous good effects, but then it becomes a, something in its own right, and it begins to perpetrate itself and ceases to be something that God is doing. And I think we need to think today, Ken, about how that applies to us. And I believe that the rule is solid and that it will work. Uh, probably not the way we think it would, but in some way better than we think it would. Because there's always that problem of not putting the new wine in the old bags. And we have to be careful and not do that. Yes, I, I have a question. It's, it's a kind of a compound sure. question. And I've never articulated it in my mind before, so I'm a little, no, hopefully, I'll, okay. have, hopefully no. I'll ask the question adequately. A good time. Um, looking at the triune nature of God and the righteousness that's rolled into the triune nature of God, mm -hmm. and e even trying to uh, understand the uh, maybe arguments from necessity versus you know, j revelation, God's Bible, that God's triune. Mm -hmm. What do we tell people that are monotheistic like Jews or, or Muslims? Mm -hmm. I, I often get into dialogues about the moral character of God. But yes. how, do we, how do we entwine, I mean, how necessary is the Trinity entwined in the perfect perfection, moral perfection of God? And, or can God be morally perfect as an individual versus a three-party, perfectly unified three? Is that making sense? Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, a lot of really good stuff in that question. <laughs> um, one of the things we want to say to people generally is God's going to do right by everybody. We really do want to say that. He's going to do right by everybody. What is right, he will do. And uh, no one is going to miss heaven by a hair. Right. Um, so we want to affirm that. That's a part of the vision of the goodness of God. Paul does that, by the way, in dealing with this issue to Jews with reference to Gentiles in Romans 2. And uh, this is such an important issue. Let me just read a line or two here. And there are other passages that we could go to, but I think this one will suffice for uh, carrying on the discussion. Uh, Paul is talking here about the impartiality of God. And um, he says that in verse 6 of Romans 2, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Now see, because we believe in salvation by grace, we're apt to not emphasize this. Uh, God is going to render every man according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Now see, that's a general statement. Anyone who does that, will have eternal life. Doesn't say they have to believe in the Trinity. Doesn't tell you how he's going to do it. 
So that's a, that's a passage that we need to think about along with others in the book of Acts and elsewhere that talk about this. For example, in Acts 17, there's an interesting phrase that um, opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, verse 23, For while I was passing through, the examin through and examining the objects of your worship, this is in Athens, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance... This I proclaim to you. That's an interesting phrase because he doesn't say you're not worshiping God. He says you worship him in ignorance. You need to understand and I'm here to help you understand. And of course that was what Jesus said to the people in his day and Paul says that in other contexts here. So I think we really want to affirm that look, God's going to do the right thing. Now, I don't believe that whatever the right thing is will be accomplished without the Trinity being involved. But I do think that getting the right view of the Trinity is not required of anyone in order to be saved. Now, of course, we have traditions that say that it is. There's the old creed that says if you don't get this right, uh, about the Trinity, neither confounding the substance nor dividing, dividing the substance nor confounding the persons, then you're going to go to hell. And I think we just have to say, well, that's not something that comes out of Revelation, but it's a, a part of a creed. Um, it has an Im something important to say, but you don't have to get that right. I mean, the, the, I didn't have it right when I was converted. I'm not sure I've got it right now. And I wouldn't like to think that I have to stand before God and recite it just right in order to get in. See, as um, um, Kempis says so beautifully, Thomas Kempis, in the first little chapter of The Imitation of Christ, that it doesn't, it doesn't give you any advantage to be able to define the Trinity if by your pride in doing so you displease the Trinity. So, see, we're very big on the definitions. But God is more interested in practice and where our heart is. And uh, I think that's what we need to say about that. Now, with reference to things like Jews and Muslims and so on, I think the general principle applies in the same way. If they can match up to what God is talking about here in Romans 1. Now, I wouldn't want to encourage anyone to think that they can. And so when I'm talking with someone, I don't encourage them to just stick with what they've got. I say, you better think about that. And you think you filled a bill, maybe you should do some more time in examining your life and see if you really live up to what Paul is talking about here. Paul doesn't say anyone does it. <laughs> he does say if someone does it, then eternal life. And I think we really need to be generous on this point. Um, because people who have got it fixed in their heads that they're righteous in one way or another, as Jesus said to people in his own day, he didn't come to them. He came to help people who needed help. And, of course, he was concerned about those who thought they didn't need help, but he recognized that they were blinded and that there was not a lot that could be done for them until they were prepared to say, I need help. I think that's the way we have to go with that. We're going to take two more questions. Uh, Dallas, on the topic of reason and knowledge. Yes. Um, what is the role of the church in helping disciples find the starting point and the proper connections to God and Christ, the Holy Spirit, in their life? Yeah, I think it is to represent an answer to the basic questions of life lived out in real life. Uh, and that would include things like explicit teaching, evangelism, and so on. But more importantly, it, it includes a kind of life that is filled with the good things of the kingdom of God that will enable other people to say there is hope. I've got to find out what this is. But I see there's hope because here's Bill Heatley and Dallas Willard and Gary and so on down the line, and they're doing it. And... Uh, now, I believe that the church should be a center of people like that. And that its whole 
the church now as the local congregation, and certainly at the higher levels too, like the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church or whatever church you're talking about. That should be what it represents, is that kind of life. Unfortunately, it often isn't because of this problem of getting absorbed in self-perpetuation and uh, winding up making little Lutherans and little Baptists and little this, that, and the other. And, uh, you know, that's not necessarily a disciple. So what we want to focus on here is having that kind of life which people who want to know can find and see and can be taught about, and they're ready to be taught about. And uh, uh, like what you're writing about and thinking about on your own, about the work situation, uh, what a desperate need there is for people who are hopeful about life to be present on the job. You know, because, and that's a great testimony, to just have hope in the ordinary circumstances of life. I think that's the main thing that we do. Uh, in our local congregations. And then we're ready to teach. And I think we should boldly say, well, look, you know, there's this group of people that have the answers to these questions. Uh, and then that'll shake people up because they say, well, I don't want you to lay your answer on me. And so on. They say, well, you know, uh, maybe they're not like that. And uh, perhaps uh, you'd like to have dinner with us or something of that sort, and just listen. And nobody's going to bite you. And then you can compare their answers to your answers. So I think that's a good way to go about it. And the Alpha program, you know, it actually is very good with that. They're, they're very light in their touch, very friendly, loving, open. And I think that it's had such a great effect just because of that. Um, you had a question about um, how do we get mankind, Christian, non-Christians, to become more knowledgeable or realize the importance of learning about the moral law or the foundations of God? Because just being here for myself, I mean, I go to work, I take care mm -hmm. of my family, I go to mm -hmm. church, I pray, have a relationship with Christ, mm -hmm. and there's a part of me I still feel lazy. It's like I'm saying, you know, for any mass change to occur mm -hmm. throughout the world, to have the knowledge of the truth, mm -hmm. how, how can we get the masses of people to understand yes. the importance of this learning right. and knowledge yeah. to get there? Well, really, mainly, that, that is the responsibility of people who are in leadership. I, I spent some time talking about journalism, for example. But in all the areas of leadership, and most of all in the area of education, uh, and that may not be something that you need to spend your time on. On the other hand, it may be, you know. But there are people who need to spend their time on that, talking about it, in some cases getting involved in it at, a very, at various levels, and really trying to make a difference. Now, maybe you can pray for me, Don, because I'm really in the center of the fire on this. Not, not in the sense that I'm, I, people are extremely gracious to me. I, no one's after me as far as I know. Um, <laughs> but you see, what I'm talking about all the time, what I'm thinking about and writing on and speaking to students about and other faculty about and conferences of educators and so on, I need to be able to help people see how to make a difference in this context. So, you know, if I'm sure you have a lot of things to pray about, and I'm not trying to put a burden on you, but I need people to pray for me and talk to me and instruct me, and we need to think in terms of the leaders who are responsible. See, the sponsor of leaders is human society is created to run with leaders. It has to have leaders. It can't work any other way. And so that when Jesus talks about the blind leading the blind, he's talking about a dreadful human scenario. And sometimes it's like, you know, Europe in the 30s and 40s, the lemmings are heading for the cliff, right? <laughs> sometimes it's not so clear. And sometimes the lemmings don't know where the cliff is. And it's, uh, it's, it's a very troubling thing, the responsibilities of leaders. Now, that's why I said in this last talk that there is good news for the people who are the up and in. I mean, think of someone like Peter Jennings. 
what would it mean if that man came to really understand what we've been talking about here and to see the alternatives for what they are? Well, he wouldn't come across, I'm sure, as a preacher, an evangelist, and that's all right. But he would do his job differently. See, and that's where I think we need to focus. When we think of mass change, and often it comes in very unsuspecting ways. Uh, four or five talks ago, I mentioned Bob Dylan and the Beatles. Bob Dylan and the Beatles, they weren't thinking about changing culture. They were kind of, they thought they were prophets, but they had no idea of what was going to happen. Elvis Presley didn't know what he was going to affect culture. See, this is mostly in the area that I would say is not so good. <laughs> But we can also think in terms of what is good. And we need to think of Christians in those kinds of positions and being Christian there. And that would mean that they do music, journalism, education better than the people who are not Christians. Not that they get along in a mediocre way and occasionally preach a little bit. But the, the job that has to be done would be done in the power of God and in the righteousness of Christ. And you wouldn't have to tell anyone about it. Everyone would know it. So I think that's the way we need to look at it. And that relates back to your point also, uh, Ken, because it's the leaders who have the real responsibility. And often our leaders uh, in religion will talk about this kind of movement and say, let's have one but they don't actually do the things that would make it happen. And they remain mired in their religious activities or social activities, and they're not able to step forward and do it. See, we are called back today to Mount Carmel. It is the God who answers by fire that will be worshipped, and that's where we have to stand. It can't be business as usual. Well, thank you very much again.